Hi there, my name is Nick Day, and my talk is called Painting the World with Fractals, How Creative Expression Reveals a Hidden Order of Reality. So this talk is about art, and because it's also referencing fractals, it's about mathematics. And so we're looking at a kind of convergence of those two areas. And with that in mind, I, I'd like to start with this quote by Galileo. So he said, The universe cannot be read until we have learnt the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language, and the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without which means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. Galileo pretty much claimed mathematics as the indispensable language, and, and who could refute that? Well, let's just put a counterpoint to that um, with um, 19th century American scientist and astronomer Maria Mitchell, who said, we need imagination in science. It is not all mathematics, nor all logic, but it is somewhat beauty and poetry. So this amazing painting is by the acclaimed 20th century abstract expressionist Jackson Pollock. And, you know, this canvas is huge, like most of his works, and, and to stand before it can be a profound experience. Pollock became famous for his unique style of streaks and splatters and drips, and this technique appears to be entirely spontaneous and random, even though Pollock himself didn't claim it was. He claimed there was a method to it. In the 1990s, a physicist named Richard Taylor made a detailed analysis, and he showed that the seemingly random streaks of paint were actually fractals, self-similar patterns that recur across multiple scales. So Pollock, he made these paintings decades before fractals were even known about, so he couldn't have done it consciously. And his paintings are known for their astronomic price tags, so they would be fairly easy to replicate and therefore easy to fake. But when Richard Taylor went on to analyse known forgeries, he was able to show that while they might convince an unsuspecting buyer, they, they were not fractal. And that gave the game away. So I'm going to talk just for a few moments about geometry and the mathematics behind it, because that'll help us understand what's going on with Jackson Pollock and his fractals. So the Galileo said the language of the universe was mathematical and the letters were triangles and circles and geometric figures. And these objects had been identified as far back as ancient Egypt. But it was Pythagoras and Plato and Archimedes and Euclid who really made them famous. So Euclidean geometry is, is based on axioms and formulae and describes the relationship between numbers and triangles and cubes and spheres. And there is a transcendental elegance to Euclidean geometry. It's not hard to see why Galileo is so impressed. But that doesn't tell the whole story. For mathematics to truly be the lang language of the universe, it, it would also need to apply to the many irregular forms we, we see around us, not just simple objects like triangles and cubes, which on the face of it are purely man-made. And that's where this man enters the story. This is Leonardo of Pisa. Now, he lived a few centuries before Galileo, and he's known for popularizing Hindu Arabic numerals and writing the Liber Abaci, the Book of Calculation. But what Leonardo was most famous for was this simple recursive formula, where each number is calculated by adding together the two previous numbers. And when represented on a graph, we get this distinct spiral shape. And as I'm sure you've already guessed, Leonardo of Pisa was also known as Fibonacci. So what's remarkable about the Fibonacci sequence is how it directly relates to naturally occurring forms and patterns, whether it's a, a nautilus shell, a fiddlehead fern, water swirling down the drain, or indeed a spiral arm galaxy. And a few other 
mathematicians took a shot at recursion over the years, Leibniz, Gaston, Julia. But in the end, it took a modern-day genius to really unlock its full potential. And I am, of course, here talking about Benoit Mandelbrot. Now, Mandelbrot was a polymath, and he applied himself to a lot of areas, including statistical physics, computer science, meteorology, hydrology, linguistics, geomorphology, economics, and metallurgy. But he's best known for coining the term fractal and for describing the Mandelbrot set, a recursive formula based on complex numbers. Mandelbrot had a huge advantage over all the other mathematicians who had previously explored the ideas of recursion because he could use powerful computers to crunch the numbers again and again and again. And when those results were represented graphically, they produced this extraordinary object, which nowadays we're very familiar with. But at the time, it was unlike anything that had really been seen before. And it had an intriguing feature, um, an infinitely complex edge, which had self-similarity across multiple scales. And as you have probably seen, when we zoom in and out, we can see that the basic shape recurs and seems to go on forever. So not only that, it turns out that the highly complex edge of a fractal rather resembles equally complex features seen in nature that couldn't previously be described using Galileo's language of triangles and squares. So, for example, these intricate outlines of clouds or rugged coastlines that eventually came to be known as statistical fractals. So they may not be mathematically exact, but their essential pattern falls within statistically self-similar and scalable parameters. So one of the best known examples of this is branching form. So here on the right is an exact branching fractal compared with an actual tree on the left, which is a statistical fractal. So as we now know, there are many examples of branching fractal form in nature. For example, lightning, or the bronchial structure of the lung, or neurons and synapses. And this map, which shows every major river basin in the United States. Man-made structures can take a similar form. This map of Europe shows the arterial road system for each capital city. And branching form can be used in a meta way to represent information. The metaphor in this example is the tree of life, where the trunk represents life itself, and the branches, the twigs, and the leaves represent the various domains, classes, orders, and species. And represented this way, we can see that evolution itself could be considered fractal. And that would align with Darwin's theory of adaptation, which does depend on the principle of recursion, taking existing information and adding new, a new variation, if you like. Here I have chosen 12 words entirely at random. The one thing they have in common is that they each have a Wikipedia page. So we have golf, smartphone, Mozart, fractal, the Louvre, John Lennon, broccoli, ecstasy, shoes, Japan, Rumi, and love. So thanks to a clever algorithm, if we were to follow the very first link on each page and then repeat the process following the first link from that page and so on, we find that all the links eventually lead to, and yes, this will disappoint some mathematicians, Everything leads to philosophy. And interestingly, tracing all these connections creates a branching form, suggesting that there is some kind of fractal substructure and function to knowledge itself. So now we'll take a look at applied fractals and see what we can do with them. Now, this is a photograph of a beautiful Scottish landscape on a rare sunny day. And here's another view of some remote, rugged mountains. But there's just one thing. 
This second one isn't a photograph of an actual place. It's a computer image, and it's made up of millions of pixels. So in the early days of CGI, computer graphics, to create such a photorealistic picture was no easy task. And if you wanted to animate it, to use it in a motion picture, well, that meant redrawing and repositioning every single pixel of every single frame at 24 frames a second. And that required an unfeasibly massive amount of computing power. But then, in 1980, a young computer scientist named Lauren Carpenter discovered a way to apply fractal algorithms to create complex terrain. And by utilising the principles of similarity across multiple scales, he was able to dramatically reduce the amount of computing power required to animate a photorealistic landscape. And in 1982, he modelled an entire planet for Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. Lauren went on to be a co-founder of Pixar Studios, and in 2001, he won an Oscar for his contribution to computer animation. And now, every motion picture with CGI effects utilises those fractal algorithms. So we've seen how fractals appear in nature, and they also appear in architecture, especially when the architect wants to reference nature. So this is the vaulted ceiling of La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, and the architect, Gaudi, wove the form of trees into his design. And this is Stuttgart Airport, a more contemporary example of trees directly inspiring architecture. But fractal forms aren't always so literal. Across Persia and Central Asia, Islamic architects created these dazzling geometric designs for mosques, using vivid colours and a, a lattice effect of scalable symmetry. Now, what's interesting about these designs is that people who have experienced altered states particularly with psychedelics, may find them very familiar. And it's, it's not really known whether the architects of that era were using psychedelics in some kind of sacred or spiritual setting, and then recreating the visions they had experienced. But there certainly seems to be a compelling correlation. But this one is not a building. This is a painting by psychedelic artist Alex Gray. And here are some of those same features. Vivid colours, a lattice effect of repeating, scalable, geometric shapes. Now, Alex Gray started out as an anatomical illustrator, whose art was strongly influenced by psychedelics. And his work is considered to contain transcendental or sacred geometry. This particular painting, which is called Oversoul, might be the finest representation of what is often experienced during a trip. Individual consciousness merging with universal consciousness, Atman merging into Brahman, or the dual becoming non-dual. Psychedelics and altered states of consciousness have long been considered a kind of portal to some greater truth or deeper reality, and psychedelic art is brimming with fractals, as these examples show. And again, these are not images of external objects. They're not mountains or coastlines or river systems. They're representations of imagery that is generated internally within the mind itself. But this picture, while it might look like the others, is actually of the brain. This is the connectome created as an etching and then colorized. The resemblance to internally generated imagery is remarkable. This is Jason Paget, who presented at a TSC conference in Helsinki in 2011. In 2002, he received a brain injury that left him seeing the world very differently, as if everything was finely granulated or tessellated, and he would see motion as if in a series of juddering frames, rather like an old movie. Jason became prodigious at mathematics, uh, which he'd had no interest in prior to his injury, and he was eventually diagnosed with acquired savant syndrome. He was inspired to make these drawings of highly complex geometrical structures that had fractal form. We see something similar in the sacred art of Tibet and India in mandalas, 
geometric configurations that carry profound spiritual meaning, even pointing to the creation of the universe. It's as if some underlying structure is being revealed, or as physicist David Bohm might say, something implicate is unfolding and becoming explicate in our consciousness. So we looked at fractal branching form. Branching form is a pattern created by the distribution of energy through a medium. And energy itself moves in waves. A wave on the ocean is in fact energy moving in water. The, the water itself doesn't really go anywhere. Waves themselves are fractal. Even in this famous 19th century painting, Under the Great Wave of Kanagawa, if we look closely, we can see the artist has captured fractal form. An electrical energy in the brain functions at varying wavelengths, which correspond with different states of consciousness. Brain waves themselves are fractal. As philosopher Kerry Welch points out, we are organized flows of energy. Our body's frequencies rest fractals within one another, from brainwave to heartbeat. There's an intriguing relationship between wavelength and frequency and geometric patterns, which is revealed when sound waves create vibration and patterns in sand or water, which is known as cymatics. And um, it's a technique that's been refined using lasers and high-speed photography. And it can produce these amazingly complex geometric patterns that resemble mandalas or the drawings of Jason Paget. So let's join a few dots between energy, fractals, and consciousness. Energy moves in fractal waves. It distributes in fractal branches. And it resonates to form fractal geometry. And ultimately, we ourselves comprise of energy and fractal forms appear throughout our physiology. And we can have direct experience of fractal form in consciousness through altered states with psychedelics or spiritual rituals or creative expression or even through brain injury. So perhaps it's not so surprising that fractals are interpreted in art as we see here in Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. So what then is the nature of a fractal and where are they? Are they everywhere all the time built in? So what we've seen is that fractal form is inherently scalable. And so it emerges from the fine scale of the universe to the cosmic. And fractals inform complex organizational processes, including evolution and knowledge. The blueprint for fractals may exist as platonic forms or as potential in David Bohm's implicate order. And therefore, we can say that fractal form is archetypal. Wolfgang Pauli, the quantum physicist, said, Archetypes that order our perceptions are the product of an objective order that transcends both the human mind and the external world. What about Jackson Pollock and his drip paintings? Well, Richard Taylor proposes that Pollock had acquired what he called fractal fluency, an affinity or familiarity with natural fractal forms that was most likely not done consciously. Pollock had developed a distinctive rhythmic swaying motion when making his drip paintings, and his canvases had increasing fractal content as his career progressed, culminating in this one, which is called Blue Poles in 1952. Pollock was drawn to Jung's theories of latent symbolism. He regarded his paintings as the union of performance and the unconscious mind. And as any artist will tell you, the, the act of creation is not a conscious activity. The artist has to get out of the way and allow something else to flow. And that something is a beautiful mystery. It's part of the magic of being human. And what Mandelbrot did was to unlock some of that mystery, to add some more characters to Galileo's language of the universe. With the discovery of fractals, um, art and mathematics were drawn closer together. As Maria Mitchell said, it's not all mathematics nor all logic. It is somewhat beauty and poetry. Thank you very much.
Hello, I'm Sasha. I'm from Germany. I'm an entrepreneur, a media analyst, filmmaker, visualist, seeker. Um, I'm a fellow of consciousness studies. I'm a TSC fellow for almost one and a half decades now. I'm coming to TSC for 13 years. Um, and recently I love to dive into the relationships between global consciousness and social media, the rising star in the media scene since almost yeah two decades now. Um, yeah, it's great to be here and thanks for the interest in my talk. If you have ever been to a TSC in person before, there's a good chance we met already. Um, together with Nick Day, um, I'm helping to make um, a program called Consciousness Central. Um, we usually record a daily show during the conference and broadcast that. Um, but this year, as there's no in-person conference, there is no show. So anyway, we collected a lot of very interesting interviews from the last uh, couple of conferences around the globe. So if you're interested, check us out on YouTube. And if you like it or if you don't like it, give us feedback. So thanks for your attention to the, towards that. So today I'm talking about um, can social media ever become conscious again, um, which is basically about what exactly? Well, let's start with this. Um, above you see the global Facebook network, how it spreads out around our beautiful planet. And below you see pictures of um, various connections of synapses within the human brain. So for me, the similarities are quite obvious, I think, for everyone looking at this as well, isn't it? So this is how I came into looking at social networks and if they might or might not be connected to human consciousness and if in what way the connection might be there. For those who still need convincing, here you see a couple of pictures um, of the opening talk of TSC 2019 in Interlaken in Switzerland last year. Olaf Sporns was talking about complex brain networks. Again, I think what he was showing, and if you um, look at the Facebook networks, I think the similarities are quite um, obvious. So, in the context, um, what I'm talking about, um, what is consciousness? I think, um, for um, taking my point of view, it's relevant to distinguish um, from the on the one hand side, the POV the science takes and which is discussed here at TSC annually. On the other hand, there is a POV on the term consciousness and the meaning of consciousness and what it is to be conscious. Um, and in a way, it is understood um, out there on the streets, on the digital streets, and the digital streets are mostly these days um, the chat networks and the chat rooms and the chat threads on social media. I have a little screenshot here to the left below um, from a random comment somewhere made on social media, I think it was on Facebook, where somebody was commenting on a social, so far wider social issue, and it ended with science conscious. And he just dropped it out there and it caught my eye for exactly that reason I just explained. Um, with what does science mean with conscious and what do people mean with conscious out there? Um, which brings me to, to, to the questions. Um, so what are the connections and differences between um, the different contexts? Um, what is it all about? What could it all be about? What's the science? And most of all, the challenge that um, to this very day, there is almost no science into um, these connections, uh, not non-existing connections. So, and I wonder why, because it's such an interesting subject. Um, so for now, my definition for what I'm talking about here is um, that I'm talking about computerized social networks that might work centralized or decentralized, 
and about the data they are processing and I'm wondering about the output it has um, and the output is it is delivering um, as a feedback loop towards humans. Um, here once more the global network of Facebook uh, it, I think this picture gives a very very good dimension of what is going on. There was nothing like this ever before in human history um, and there's always this word out there in the digital world um, about a Facebook nation and I think it's worth um, pondering on and think it through um, just to consider Facebook as a nation where this could lead and what this could be and what the dimension of this is. Um, social Quick look at social media by the numbers and the global numbers. So it's uh, the stats are based on 2017, end of 2017. So I think you can add um, roughly maybe 10-20% to every network. Um, maybe some of them just stayed where they have been for a couple of years, but we will see by the end of the year, and which hopefully might mark the end of the corona crisis as well. Um, so there may be some of them just uh, stayed flat and some of them might have gained. The biggest winner definitely already is TikTok, the famous, for some even notorious TikTok, um, which is kind of the new kid on the block in the social media space, counting um, right now around 800 million users globally. Um, we will see where it goes. Um, no matter what social network you use, they all track us in um, by promising love and feeling liked and having a good time. Also, we all know the results might be a bit more mixed in the end. So one way or the other, one social network or the other, for me the question is whether our brains eventually might dissolve totally into the intelligence and the data of these networks. <laughs> I, I, at least I love to think about this possibility. Um, so 2020, the state of affairs, the state is still a state of war of worldviews, um, which in many ways is, is a little bit of, of a tragic situation. On the other hand, there are a couple of signs um, we might make it to truly better situations um, that we have a look at. In details at this later. Um, for now, by the end of um, the summer in 2020, what were the dominant topics so far? Corona for sure, as well as Black Lives Matter, masks, should you wear a mask, shouldn't you wear a mask, it became very political. Um, what about um, um, vaccination, politics, elections? police and how conscious acts the system around all this. Well there's Twitter um, which has the situation that it carries uh, very very prominent and very very um, uh, so uh, how to say challenging politician um, on their platform since a couple of years. Uh, eventually by um, the mid of 2020 they decided to curb his output at least a little bit and they put out a sign so to say that there is, is a border and he doesn't own the network also I still think the main reaction to everything happening around Donald Trump is that they try to make a good dance between the popularity and the money they make out of it um, and trying to um, keep every tweet at least somehow in check with their guidelines. The whole thing is a very very um, complicated and very big issue which is um, not the place to debate rewrite here right now, but it really belongs here as well as it is an ongoing situation. Um, 
by the way, so sometimes Twitter is still not able to hit those that um, actually release the information. So sometimes they um, they happen to hit the wrong guy when they when they punish certain accounts. Um, on the other platform, Facebook, um, they have to deal um, with a, a boycott of their advertisement and this what happened related to uh, the Black Lives Matters um, unrest all over the US which spread um, globally um, so it's a I think it's a bittersweet thing Coca-Cola for example here um, is holding all the advertisement um, a couple of companies followed suit as well um, let's see where this all ends. At the moment, we, we live in an economic downturn, so it might be easier to um, save a couple of advertisement dollars, which we clearly have to see. It's rather a symbolic thing, and it's probably behind the scenes as well a question as well of, of a game of power. Zuckerberg himself is very, very optimistic on that. I think he's right in the end. Um, the market um, economics and, and their powers will prevail and the advertisement will come back simply because it's too many people connected on platform, it's like Facebook. Um, saying that uh, in Europe, the resistance, so to say, is still a little bit stronger with even parties like the UK Labour Party joining this. Um, given all these power battles, just recently, by the end of July, um, the big four of Silicon Valley had to um, sit in with um, um, representatives on Capitol Hill in Washington and had to debate how powerful they are and had to defend their business practices. Um, yeah, again, why is Capitol Hill doing that? Because of the power of, for example, the Facebook nation, or if you would consider Amazon as a nation or the Google nation. So um, let's have a look, because of the relevancy, at closer look here at, at what Facebook is doing now exactly to fight false information. Um, here I have an example from Germany. We had demonstrations against uh, Corona policies and there was a fight about how many people showed up for one of the events. And so Facebook um, organized an external fact-checking on that and the fact-checkers decided that that was false information and now you see it gets an overlay on the picture and you can see that they consider the information on the picture wrong and why and you get a link to um, so to say the other point of view where you can check on why the picture gets the overlay but you still can see the photo um, Facebook is very transparent on how they do the fact checking and um, they this, they decided on a code of principles. You can learn about that code of principles um, on a website as well, where how they deal with the attempt to uh, weed out the unreliable fake news and how to yeah, make information more reliable that's on the social networks. Um, they are very clear on their process how the fact-checking happens. Based on all these things, they started um, to fight certain misinformation, especially around the corona, and hit certain groups pretty hard. Um, in late summer, they, just late summer 2020, they, for example, hit a very big group of conspiracy thinkers called Quanon, um, which had over 200,000 members, and they shut that down. However, they didn't shut down everything by the Quanon um, um, people or people that 
uh, to be exact, or people that um, think quantum is a reasonable source of information. So they didn't um, shut down the entire quantum network on Facebook for sure, but uh, for me it's all rather a symbolic thing, but it's the first time that on this big, uh, on this huge level, uh, something like this is happening on, on Facebook. Um, Facebook itself, while it's um, looking into whether information is true or false based on their policies, as can still be um, very self-critical as well. So as you can see here, that happened to me. They kind of reviewed the review of my post and decided that my post wasn't um, against the community standards, so they put it back on. Um, if you want to put out an ad as a politician these days, you they clearly mark it as sponsored and they clearly say that the politician paid for it. And they are very transparent on that and show us how they do it and what the, the decision is based on. Meanwhile, on another platform, in another universe of thought probably as well, um, the American president is heavily fighting social network TikTok. Um, he threatens to take it off the US market um, based on that his opinion on it is that they don't treat the data they collect poorly and in a way that it um, is good for the American citizens and for the American economy. Um, whether he's right or wrong on that decision, I cannot... Um, make a final judgment on. Um, so I can just show that this thing is happening at the moment. Um, what we know is that TikTok is under surveillance for a while now for the way they use the data they collect and as well whether they are connected to um, uh, companies that might process the data in a way um, which wouldn't be considered appropriate. Um, and just recently we learned um, that for sure TikTok used um, ways to um, um, make sense from their perspective out of user data which um, got was banned by Google which as a result means that it's not a way we accept to deal with data in the West. As the big platforms um, fight fake news wherever they can. The extremists and conspiracy theorists and um, bad players of the news cycle try to move to the smaller networks and create a lot of problems there, which gives the platforms a lot of challenges to deal with. Um, it's happening um, as this headline shows on Telegram, Telegram was originally um, promising not to censor anything at all. Um, whether they can deal with that entirely true to that original policy in the future, uh, we will see. Um, fact is, they become more and more a haven of fake news and very extremist positions on almost anything, which is definitely not information that um, is very useful for the future of humanity out there. Um, the same thing happens on other platforms. It's always a mix of misinformation, fake news, conspiracy theories of all forms. Um, it's happening for sure on WhatsApp. They have to deal with it. It's happening on YouTube. YouTube especially has a very um, challenging situation. As you can imagine, it's easier to um, get rid of, let's say, 50 or 100 words long post on WhatsApp than and to erase content like a YouTube video that is like two hours long or just one hour or maybe 90 minutes or whatever. Especially if you want to make sure you're not just go out there and take down the entire channel, but you still want to select between certain pieces of content. So YouTube has to deal with a very intense screening process. As a lot of other platforms, they're using AI for that, but they're also using a lot of um, 
human interaction to figure out what is right or what has to be considered false or fake news out there. Um, this is especially interesting as YouTube is not just a content channel, a content platform, but it carries as well one of the biggest social networks in the world um, due to their uh, comment function. So it's always very interesting um, to watch what's happening in the YouTube space when we are debating the content of uh, online platforms. So given the situation um, and all the battles raging on, why are we still drawn to social media? Why are we still on? Why are we still attracted to this game? Um, I think personally there's this very broad sense of connectedness and for sure there's cuteness. So here you see the Fiona show which has now 3.4 million followers on its Facebook channel. Um, Fiona is a young hippo that was born in Cincinnati in the US in the Cincinnati Zoo and she was born under very um, complicated circumstances. She made it and now she lives happily with her mother in in the pool they have and they're playful and they're just beautiful to watch so it's a great distraction and it's a great symbol of love and connectedness in this otherwise quite complicated times we have um, in, in outside in the real world um, so that's um, for now for my side um, about the state of the union so to say of social media in 2020 so far we still have a couple of more months to go I again want to encourage um, some maybe some of you out there to start a serious science uh, to have a really serious look at what's going on uh, in the question of connection between human consciousness and social media if anyone wants to start a collaboration or wants to start to work on this feel free to get in touch i'm happy to talk about it and see what we can do thank you for listening uh, thank you for having me thank you tsc 2020 thank you Stuart. thank you abby thank you to the entire team and board of tsc 2020 thank you that's all for me for now um, ciao bye bye hello this is me my name is Ana Iribas Rudin. I teach at the Complutense University of Madrid, Spain, and I'm interested in art, consciousness, and new technologies. This presentation is structured in three parts. First, a brief introduction about Susan Hiller. Then we discuss telepathy and her postal artwork, Draw Together, and automatic writing, and her piece, Sisters of Menon. Let the artist introduce herself first. My name is Susan Hiller, and I'm an artist based in London. The American-British conceptual artist, Susan Hiller, born in 1940, died uh, last year, 2019 was keenly interested in consciousness, non-ordinary states, and unconventional ways of knowledge, including anomalous cognition, such as psi. These topics are often the subject matter of her work. Nevertheless, the deeper content of her oeuvre is epistemological. Questioning the prevailing ways of knowledge and opening alternate epistemologies and land are landmarks in her creative endeavours, but such openness is equally counterbalanced with a sceptical Western intellectual disposition regarding the subjects of her fascination. Hiller vindicated art as a hybrid knowledge encompassing poetic intuition and unconscious processing together with rational inquiry in an ambivalent position which may be problematic for other areas of knowledge but which can, which can perfectly coexist in art. Hiller said, I suppose I wish to avoid being understood as much as being misunderstood.
Her oeuvre can be divided into a first period, roughly covering the 70s, with minimalistic conceptual works, together with a line of collaborative performative events that she called group investigation pieces. From the 1980s, her second period is certainly more mature and artistically interesting, as well as better known by the wider public. The viewer is strongly encouraged to visit the artist's official website, susanhiller.org. In this presentation, we will be dealing with two works of Hiller's first artistic period. Firstly, a group work aligned with the postal art in vogue at the time, which was structured as a quasi-scientific experiment. Secondly, we will see a piece originated in a spontaneous experience of automatism. The works will be preceded by a brief presentation on the anomalous cognition of telepathy and the dissociative phenomenon of automatic writing, respectively. Telepathy. First, let's look at telepathy versus clairvoyance. In abnormal psychology, telepathy is a form of cognition in which the information appears to be received directly from the mind of another being. The individual emitting the information is called the sender and the one received is logically called the receiver. Telepathy is closely related to clairvoyance, where there is a purported access to information in real time about a distant event or object that is not available to the senses and in the absence of a sender. Telepathy has been extensively researched. Among the most famous experiments in the USA are those carried out in the Maimonides Institute with dreams and telepathy. Remote viewing, a form of clairvoyance, has been researched in the military project Stargate in the USA. When the intention of the receiver is to capture an image drawn or contemplated by a sender, it can be difficult to assess if a successful anomalous cognition is due to telepathy or to clairvoyance. Among the history of domestic experiences with telepathy, one of the most renowned is a series of experiments carried out by the couple of Mary and Upton Sinclair, published in 1930 with a preface by Albert Einstein under the title Mental Radio, Does It Work and How? Experiments followed regular patterns. At a certain agreed upon time in different rooms or houses, the sender drew something, for example, copying images from magazines, and then concentrated on the drawing, staring at it for five to 20 minutes. The receiver also concentrated in a state of relaxed receptivity, asking her unconscious to show her what was in the mind of the sender. In the, if the image persisted and returned once and again to her inner vision, she gave it credit and drew or took notes. On another occasion, uh, the drawing would be in a sealed envelope, which Mary put on her solar plexus and tried to capture its contents. Strongly inspired by the Sinclair's domestic experiments with telepathy, Hiller set out to structure a group investigation piece called Draw Together, primarily intended as an artistic inquiry into shared subjectivity and distributed authorship. She made use of the avant-garde genre of male art. The piece was both experimental, freely using the scientific method, but also it was ironic and mocking. She invited 100 artists to take part in a telepathy experiment worldwide, where on agreed upon days and times, a sender, which is Hiller, as participant A, uh, would concentrate for at least five minutes on one out of 100 images and photos randomly picked by her husband as participant B. Uh, she would try to transmit its essential details to the other participants 
who in turn would attempt to tune in and record their impressions in drawing or other media. The receiver's impressions would be mailed to London, where they would be correlated, analysed and admired, and there was also finally the aim of producing a complete report of some kind at the end. Nevertheless, a postal strike unforeseen by the artist disrupted the procedure, causing the delay and loss of the majority of the feedbacks. So, in Hiller's words, it falls very nicely into the area of art and funky documentation. In the duality between structure and randomness, we see that what played against the scientific character of the piece actually reinforced its poetic fate instead. Despite all, there were some promising results, especially as also happens in formal telepathic experiments when the images were particularly vivid and or emotional in content. An example of visual vividness was a target of a dark red Navajo blanket with a zigzag pattern, which elicited in several receivers either the color red, a reddish sunset, or mountains, palm trees, zigzags, or triangles. The piece draw together is minor and has not received attention in the art world, or very little. In hindsight, Hiller said that its greatest value was to open the way for the episode that gave birth to Sisters of Menon. But before we turn to that piece, let's look a little into automatic writing. In the phenomenon of motor automatism, there is a lack of sense of agency, reflection or full awareness in the realization of movements. The person produces movements, utterances, vocalizations, writings or drawings in a dissociated manner. The pioneer theory of automatism was developed by Frederick Myers in the late 19th century. Using the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation as a metaphor, where the visible wavelengths are but a small section of the whole, Myers said that consciousness was a spectrum where most of it would lie beyond our ordinary awareness, the areas of so-called subliminal consciousness, whereas so-called supraliminal consciousness would correspond to our narrower everyday waking consciousness. Both regions, subliminal and supraliminal, would be permeable. Hence, contents of subliminal areas of consciousness could surface in the supraliminal, although accompanied by a lack of awareness of how they were elaborated. Their content could come from a high level of development, as is the case of creative inspiration, or from a low level, as would be the case of hysteria. Subliminal material would tend to appear in what we now call altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness. Various types of automatisms were studied at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Mediums attra attracted the attention of Myers, James and Flournoy because they manifested a natural disposition towards dissociation that is embedded in the human psyche, therefore easily manifesting what they call secondary personalities or alters. Aside from fraud, stage tricks and personal unconscious, the ultimate question remained open as to the possibility of access to contents beyond the individual psyche. During the heyday of spiritism, one of the most frequent techniques for the amateur practice of automatism was a planchette designed to facilitate the free movement of the hands. Without need of instrumentation, spectacular mediums were able to perform feats like writing automatically while asleep or writing one text with each hand simultaneously. In a psychoanalytic frame, Anita Mühl trained her patients in automatic writing to unveil contents of the personal unconscious for therapeutic purposes. Around the second decade of the 20th century, 
automatism had a powerful comeback in the arts thanks to the first phase of the surrealist movement. With a secular goal of unveiling the unconscious, a fountain of truth and originality, and strongly inspired in Freud's free association technique, the surrealists practiced extensively with automatism. Its first historical product was Breton and Suppose the Magnetic Fields, Les Champs Magnétiques, published in 1920. The first manifesto of surrealism, published in 1924, defines surrealism as pure psychic automatism. In the secrets of written surrealist composition, it advises to keep an open frame of mind, passive and receptive, to write swiftly, not to reread, make no judgments and forsake punctuation. Frequent traits of automatic writing productions are different calligraphic styles, mirror writing, uninterrupted lines without lifting the pen, ornaments, ideograms, hybrid shapes between writing and drawing, and patterns. As for the contents, incongruence, originality, humour, absurd, iteration and a prosodic tone abound. Susan Hiller was certainly acquainted with these forms of automatisms from mediums and surrealist, but it was kind of second-hand knowledge. In 1972, Hiller was staying in the French region of Occitane, where the almost feminist gnostic movement of Catharism prevailed during the Middle Ages. Here we see the cross. One day she was performing her part of the Draw Together experiment. She was and in her words, very relaxed and slightly distracted, probably in some altered state of consciousness known to her. And she put down the magazine cutout she had attempted to transmit, and suddenly her hand began to move on a blank sheet of paper. The pencil, she said, seemed to have a mind of its own. The initial childish doodle developed into words. Her hand wrote page after page of text in an unfamiliar style, while she felt she stepped aside, just watching as her hand was writing in dissociation. At the same time, the event had an everydayness to it. Formally, the traces of the pencil were, I quote, a combination of undecipherable hieroglyphics which turned into readable words with several puns, a sort of shape that looked like a child's drawing of an eye for eye, and a lot of my mirror writing, backward, reverse writing, and so forth. The voice in question was insistent, repetitive, personal, and punning. Here is the transcription. If you want to read it thoroughly, please freeze the video on each of the three following slides. The question, who is this one, repeatedly emerged, together with a plural female identity, the sisters of Menon, as did mothers of men, Menon as one, the presence of the sisters in the water and the air, zero and nothingness, fraternity in sisterhood, love across the circle, and Thebes. At the time, the artist was unable to address the contents. She really didn't have spiritualistic beliefs and didn't know what to do with the experience. Probably there was an unconscious drive not to see it. She actually believed the manuscripts had disappeared, which is doubtless a form of denial. Seven years later, she did find them. The re-encounter prompted her hermeneutical impulse. She wrote, the text must be read like the world, as a series of marks to be deciphered. Feminist and identity issues, distributed creativity, ESP, mediums, 
automatism and creativity, psychoanalysis, symbolism, Cathar history and literature furnished partial information and sources of meaning. But at a certain point, Hiller understood that there was no way to exhaust meanings and that all the many explanations that she had elaborated were equally valid. Meaning is inexhaustible. So, if any conclusion was to be taken, it was that the self is an illusory unity. One person is many voices. In the notes to the piece, she wrote, simultaneously participant and spectator, author and reader, singular and plural. I feel more like a series of activities rather than an impermeable corporeal unit, or rather, I am not a container. And this doesn't mean I don't accept personal responsibility for the transmission and presentation of this material. The final Sisters of Menon artwork consists of a central cross with four L-shaped arrangements of the sheets of paper with the automatic production made in 1972, and a later part, four smaller lateral modules, as you see in a darker blue, of transcription and commentary that includes feminist interpretations and dates of 1979. The total shape is that of a cross echoing the shape of the Cathar symbol. An important lesson Hiller learned from this episode was to incorporate irrationality as an equal valid source as rationality. In subsequent works of the 80s, Hiller exploited an automatism more related to bodily rhythms in the form of non-significant calligraphies and vocalizations. The graphic traces would be visual forms without a reference to intelligible words. They wouldn't demand any decoding into the verbal mode. Vocal automatisms, like children's preverbal utterances, also became liberated from meaning. The practice of scribbling and vocalizing had no goal but the embodied pleasure of the automatic activity in itself. If related in any measure to language, this automatism was language in the making, in its early stages. I'll leave you with some vocalizations taken from the installation Elan. For further reading, there are two texts in Spanish and one in English that I can recommend by myself in this sense. The first is my dissertation. It's on Susan Hiller and consciousness. The second is an article on from the Freud Museum and psychoanalysis. So first and second in Spanish. And the third is an article to appear later this year in the Journal of Parapsychology about psi and anomalous experiences in Hiller's work. Of course, Susan Hiller's official website again. Please don't miss it. And thank you. Hi there, um, my name is uh, Shoshana Bryn Jones Square. It is such an honor to be part of this amazing conference. Um, all of my idols are here. I won't list them all because it is everyone. Um, so I am approaching all of this from an, a literary background. So I received my PhD from Oxford um, in English literature specialty uh, in 18th, 19th century literature, but my work's always been quite interdisciplinary. So I, I love to bring in um, science and psychology and philosophy because I think it's so essential for us to combine the disciplines so that we can really address um, um, many of the issues that we're dealing with right now in the world. So um, again, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be a part of this and I cannot wait to read, not read your presentations, I get to actually see them. So that's so exciting. I'll move on. All right, so the title of my paper is our presentation, Making Waves, Ripples of Consciousness and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, so what's amazing about the novel is she's engaging with so many of the same questions that we're asking today. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be conscious, to be aware of being conscious? Um, so what is awareness? Um, what is the self? So all these vital questions, where did we come from? Um, where are we going? The stuff that we're asking all the time 
Um, it's really what, Mich what Mary Shelley is focusing on in Frankenstein. So it's a brilliant novel. I'm sure lots of you have read it. Um, all right, so um, as I started this, I had way too many ideas um, and still do. So this, this is way too long. I think it's 177 slides, so I won't put you through that. Um, but I wanted to share this quotation from Virginia Woolf. I adore her so much. Um, and yeah, she, as you likely know too, um, is Dream of Consciousness and wrote um, The Waves. Um, and it's always about this idea of, of waves in the mind, right? This idea of consciousness and how we express it. Um, so anyway, but she says um, in her writer's diary, I dare say I shan't be able to carry it out. I am stuffed with ideas. I can feel, I feel I can use up everything I've ever thought. So she's talking about this in reference to Mrs. Dalloway, um, but uh, this is how I feel <laughs> for this particular presentation, just reading all of your um, abstracts. Just I, my brain was going in every direction, wanting to bring everything in. So um, incredibly excited about this. Thank you. Um, so the story of Frankenstein is is like an origin story, right? It's the about the creation of a, a creature. Um, whether that creature is human or not is what um, is considered, whether he's conscious, whether he um, sort of experiences what we feel. Um, so it also it's, um, makes reference to Milton's Paradise Lost. It opens with a quotation from Paradise Lost um, that I'll bring in later. Um, so very biblical and references to Genesis and creation. Um, so we emerge from darkness into light, from the nothingness of non-existence to the somethingness of conscious experience um, in an echo of the dawning of the universe itself. Um, as physicist Ian Walmsley writes, light gives light. What did I just say? Life gives life. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear, eh? Um, so according to Genesis, before God created light, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. However, when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, again, this movement and waves, um, moved by the invisible or the numinous, um, and commanded, let there be light, uh, the stillness was disturbed, the water set in eternal motion, and the darkness made dazzlingly bright. So again, light and dark are also um, very important themes in, in the novel. Um, and this idea of, of motion and spirit and the divine, um, the invisible playing upon um, humanity, inspiring humanity, and actually creating this life, um, eternal life. So beautiful stuff. I'll move on. So, and you obviously know this, um, science is a similar story about the birth of our inexplicable but miraculous universe. Uh, so as Hawking writes, I'm sure you know that dude, uh, there was a time called the Big Bang when the universe was infinitesimally small and infinitely dense. And one may say that time had a beginning at the Big Bang, the instant when suddenly the, beers, the universe became saturated by light. Uh, so like the wind suddenly creating perpetually cresting waves in a motionless and soundless sea. So the Big Bang is said to have created cosmic ripples, ever-expanding waves, swelling outwards. Very beautiful. So uh, fascinatingly, um, the lovely, amazing Baroness Susan Greenfeld, I love you, uh, uses an almost identical analogy to describe the awakening of consciousness, liking it to a stone being thrown into a pool of water. I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, so Greenfeld suggests that the stone is like a strong sensory experience, such as the sound of an alarm clock, uh, the equivalent of throwing the stone very forcefully and thereby generating strong enough ripples to rouse us from senselessness to awareness. Uh, she's great. Um, so according to Greenfield, again, hope I have this right, uh, consciousness is more like a dimmer switch, so it has levels and gradations, um, so I'm more conscious now than I was when I was a child, and I'm more conscious than a dog, but that doesn't mean that my dog isn't conscious, so again, this idea that it has levels and gradations. Um, so again, the stone is like a strong sensory experience, I've said this already, so I don't need to repeat it, it's there for you if you need it. Um, so over 200 years ago, uh, the teenage Mary Shelley, uh, Frankenstein was published when she was only 19 years old, which is nuts. Um, the very structure of the, so it's framed narratives actually mirrors this uh, rippling effect that is, is used to describe the awakening of consciousness. Um, and his story is just told and retold both within the novel, as I'll explain, but then by us outside the novel. Um, it's still being retold in so many different iterations. It's just, uh, it's it's crazy. It's wonderful. I'm um, just showing how this this idea has been kept alive um, and sort of transfigured and transformed by us, but still holding that essential essential meaning. All right. So yeah, the narrative again. It's a frame narrative. So you have the creature's um, tail right in the center, um, and but he does learn language um, through the Delacy family. So they're also at the center. So the Delacy family. Um, the creature 
um, finds a Hubble near their place and observes them. So he observes humanity. What does it mean to be human? He learns sympathy and compassion from them. He learns about music. He um, learns to read. He reads Goethe and he reads Milton and he learns to relate that to his own experience and actually causes an existential crisis, his reading. Um, so you get that story and then he tells his story to Victor Frankenstein, his creator and very neglectful parent. Uh, Victor Frankenstein then tells it to Robert Walton, who is a northern adventurer. Um, he's heading towards the land of eternal light, so very symbolic. Um, and he meets Victor Frankenstein as Victor Frankenstein is pursuing the creature. Um, so after he tells it to Robert Walton, <laughs> Robert Walton tells it to his sister, Mary Savile, who has the same initials as Mary Shelley. Um, and then from there, it's the, the outside reader, that's us. Um, so we, the readers, keep the novel alive. Um, we retell it and retell it in manifold iterations. Um, and as I will show in this presentation, because it's not a paper, um, the novel is the study of consciousness, um, an exploration of what it is and what it means to be alive. Um, so it's a great novel. Um, so the epigraph I was talking about um, is from Paradise Lost, and it's Adam speaking. The creature represents both Adam and Satan, um, and the same thing goes for Victor Frankenstein, who's considered like a doppelganger. Um, all the creatures are kind of like sort of imitations of one another. Um, so again, it's kind of similar to a talk about Virginia Woolf later, where she talks about the idea that she doesn't want to create personality. She, so she said a personality and character should be eliminated at all costs and what she wants to present are perspectives, um, which is pretty, pretty neat. So I, again, this sort of this vast array of perspectives, you have to dissolve the self and sort of in order to embody these different, these different identities. But so the quotation is, did I request thee maker from my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? So the creature himself is asking this. He didn't ask to be born. We didn't ask to be born. Um, so what does this mean? Why have we been created? We don't know, uh, which is pretty exciting. So yeah, it's as if um, the story is like a form of expedited evolution. So the creature is born. He then, as you'll see, experiences synesthesia as, synesthesia as he's a child. And then he comes to understand all the senses and goes through the, the major uh, stages of being human um, throughout the novel and the point being that he is is trying to understand what it means to be him just like we're trying to uh, figure out what it means to be us and why we're here um, so he has this existential crisis again born of reading uh, Milton especially and also after um, his moment of, of self-awareness um, that we usually achieve when I think what is it eight to 12 months, I can't remember what age um, we generally achieve self-awareness, but he looks in a pool of water, sees his reflection, and that's at the moment he realizes he's different from other people. And just as when we're children, when we're young, we, we don't notice that we are separate from our parents until we gain that, that realization that, that this hand is, is different than our mother's hand. So it goes for the same experiences with Mary Shell asking, uh, so what is a soul? What is being? What is consciousness? Um, what is selfhood? What is feeling? Um, really important to the novel is how can we connect better? Um, um, so Mary Shelley points out in most of her novels the sort of failure of sympathy that happen, happens so often. So most of her characters are always seeking sympathy and identification um, from other people, asking, do you understand me? Do you know what it feels like? Um, a, a very, yet another important theme in Frankenstein is the idea of hearing and listening versus seeing. Um, so the creature is constantly asking his creator, Victor, Victor Frankenstein, hear me listen to my tale, um, even at one point covering Victor Frankenstein's eyes and saying, here I cover the prejudice, um, so his his sight that prevents him from empathizing with him. His, he can't, Victor Frankenstein can't get past the external form in order to see the creature's inner self and consciousness. So also this idea, how can we ever authentically connect with another person if we don't have direct access to that other person's subjectivity. We can try to understand it through empathy, which is such a powerful uh, faculty that we have through the imagination. Um, but again, we can't ever know exactly what it's like to be another person. So again, her novels are about how to find authentic connection, how to find sympathy, and her ultimate argument being that, that sympathy, um, which she understood in the same way that we understand empathy now, um, is, is something that could transform the world if we all could develop it. And she suggests, um, actually, as does Adam Smith, um, that we can do so through through reading um, and imagination, which again, exercises our empathy by requiring us to um, uh, sort of 
taken an imaginative leap in time and space in order to see the world from another's perspective. Um, and in order to do that too, when we're reading, we have to suspend or dissolve the egoic self um, so that we can truly connect authentically and truly um, and try to really understand the other person. Uh, Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein fails to do that, um, as do most of the characters in the novel, sadly. And we so the wildly amazing Susan Blackmore, um, some of the questions that she asks about consciousness and selfhood in, um, uh, sorry, blah, 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 I'm a little tired today. <laughs> in Conversations on Consciousness, in her introduction, she asks, what could a self be? Um, the essence of consciousness is subjectivity, and subjective experience seems always to imply someone who is having the experience, in other words, a self. Um, but what sort of thing could be the experiencer of experiences? I love that. Um, so again, this is uh, this is precisely what Mary Shelley asked in Frankenstein. Asked that too. Um, these are more questions that apply so well to Frankenstein. I should italicize this. Um, so in Plato, a very short introduction, um, Julia asks, um, our bodies are animated. Is what animates them itself some kind of physical body, or is it something of an entirely different kind? If the latter, how is its nature to be understood? Um, and so Victor Frankenstein um, says he delves into nature's recesses in order to understand the principle of life. Um, and so, yeah, creates this artificial body, uh, not totally artificial because he uses human and animal body parts um, to create this, this human being in hopes that he will um, sort of usurp the position of God and, and rule this species. So it's also really connected to the idea of science getting out of hand, which you know too, and also the lack of forethought. So uh, Victor Frankenstein decides to do this without thinking ahead of the consequences. So this idea that um, that ideas can get out of hand. So not only in this sense, but as I'll hopefully get to later, um, for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in her 1831 introduction to the novel, she, she talks about um, how how the novel, the creature itself, is this this idea that's percolating, but once you set it out into the world, um, you have no control over it anymore. So kind of like the death of the author thing too, right? Um, you have this idea, you share it with the world, um, and then you no longer have control. Um, so same thing goes for Victor's experiment. If he had had the foresight or forethought, um, which is uh, what Prometheus means, um, the modern Prometheus, the title of the novel, um, perhaps it wouldn't have gotten out of hand. So Mary Shelley is also advocating for a science informed by humanities too. So again, that interdisciplinary idea that we need both. Um, I won't keep reading these. You probably had a chance to read them while I... So like uh, Mary Shelley, um, her fellow romantic authors and poets were equally dazzled by consciousness and the conundrum of existence and what it all means um, and hyper aware of the interconnectedness of everything, of mind and universe and nature and, and us. Um, so they would really bring that out through their writings, which I will discuss below. Um, so again, like uh, this wonderful, wonderful Ramachandran, we love him, uh, the romantic author sought to unravel the mysterious connections between brain, mind, and body. Um, and they actually used uh, multidisciplinary, <laughs> oh my god, multidisciplinary perspectives to do so. Uh, through literature, philosophy, science, medicine, and psychology, they explored the same questions uh, that still very much captivate and elude us today. So William Wordsworth was a very psychological poet. Um, his um, long poem, The Prelude, is just one long meditation on his own mind. Um, so it's both poetical and psych psychological. Um, and he uses the lilting and metrical language of poetry, metaphor, to express his own consciousness, um, creating a copy of his own mind on the page for himself and his readers to psychoanalyze. So again, I love that idea that we can express our consciousness and see this sort of physical manifestation of what's going on in our minds on the page, um, which I think Wordsworth thought was pretty cool too, through writing about the self. Uh, John Keats, um, he sadly died of tuberculosis at uh, age 25, but his poetry was very much informed by his medical knowledge. Um, and he often used his poetry therapeutically um, sort of offering it to his readers as a remedy for their own physical or psychic pain. He was um, ill most of his life um, and had a really difficult life. So um, some have suggested he might have um, had synesthesia because he uses um, 
the literary trope of synesthesia in his poetry. Um, so it's this like luxurious immersion in sensation, explores the enigmas of mind, perception, and subjective experience, all the stuff we love. Um, and his use of synesthetic imagery in particular, um, as you guys know, one mode of sensation is described in terms of another. This is when we're referring to it in, as a literary device, um, serves to enhance the reader's essential experience of his poems. Um, so in Ode to a Nightingale, um, oh, for a draft of vintage, tasting of flora and the country green, of dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth. So it's his his poetry, as with uh, Percy Shelley, um, he may have been a synesthete too, um, just always sort of mixing the senses and um, tasting music and all of that fun stuff that I was. So in a famous letter to his friend Benjamin Bailey, um, Keats writes that I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. But the imagined seizes as beauty must be truth, whether it existed before or not. For I have the same idea of all our passions as of love. They are all in their sublime, creative, of essential beauty. Oh, for a life of sensations rather than a life of thoughts. So in Ode on a Grecian Urn, he does, he hands it with um, beauty is truth truth, beauty, um, and this idea, again, of, of a life of sensations, um, thought being this, this like struggle, as you'll see when I talk about um, Mary Shelley's creation of Frankenstein, when she tries to think too hard about it, um, nothing comes. Um, it's only when she's able to sort of enter this like waking dream, she's about to go to sleep and see the world through the um, sort of imaginative eye that the idea rushes upon her. So again, this idea of, of um, being divinely inspired. And I think I might say something that I don't have it. <laughs> um, so what Keyes' description does um, is unite the physical sensations, presenting his readers with an altered and more splendid vision of the world. Um, so it's, it's almost as if he's teaching us what it feels like to be synesthetic. Um, we get to sort of, and because we're such imitative creatures, it is something we could perhaps just eventually practice and learn um, through the use of metaphor. Um, so Keats then was unwittingly or maybe wittingly teaching us empathy through his poetry, providing a heightened synesthetic experience of the world and thereby awaking us to the perceptual potential, potential um, of our own minds and reminding us of the interrelatedness of all things. So he was a pretty cool guy. I'm sure you all know him very well stuff. Um, so again, by metaphorizing, uh, which is why I believe that that fiction, reading, and poetry are so so essential to the developing empathy and increasing our brain connections. Um, so we can increase the connections in our brains and perhaps even teach ourselves anesthesia. I don't know if that's true, but um, Barrett Brogard um, talks about it in the superhuman mind, and I I've been trying desperately <laughs> for years. Um, so and again, one of the most powerful ways we can engage in metaphorical thinking is through poetry and fiction, which enhance our empathic abilities. So Percy Bysshe Shelley, Mary Shelley's uh, husband, kind of a shit, but very, very talented, um, says that poetry uh, strengthens the faculty, which is the organ of the moral nature of man in the same way as exercise strengthens a limb. Um, so again, it's the imagination through exercising the imagination you are also engaging in perspective taking. You're learning to dissolve the self in order to um, enter this this other dimension of um, seeing the other person, sorry, seeing the world from the other's point of view, which is so spectacular and interesting that um, he's talking about, and it has proved that this, it is like a muscle, right? You're strengthening it, you're strengthening the connections in, um, in your brain. So again, very cool era to be studying and so fun to study it in relation to whatever, what you're all doing, uh, which is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it would also be very cool because it, it's a way of producing hyper-aware individuals able to perceive and experience the world as synesthetes seats do. So this like kaleidoscopic fusion of sensations and this astonishingly symbiotic system as an astonishingly um, symbiotic system of breathtaking complexity, um, which it really is. So I think that it's so important for us just to be aware of awareness, right? And pay attention. Um, and uh, that's what the romantics are, are telling us to do too, just to to experience the world and, and uh, really, really um, here. My cat's about to come. Uh, so as a child, I mentioned this briefly, uh, the creature actually has synesthesia. Here comes my cat. Um, so a friend of mine, uh, River Doucette, I was at a conference in Ottawa on Mary Shelley. Um, and so River actually has synesthesia herself. And she pointed out um, these quotations at the conference to me and just blew my mind. So this is when the creature has been abandoned by Frankenstein. 
What a dick. And um, he is is left to fend for himself. Um, so he says, it was with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and distinct. So again, same thing. We, we don't remember our own births, which is crazy. Um, and uh, this is <laughs> very similar for him. He sort of, he already doesn't remember um, being a baby. And now he's sort of in the process of deciphering the world when he still doesn't have a, a sense of self. He hasn't um, eventually looks in a pool of water and recognizes himself and is horrified. And it's that moment of self-awareness that um, we usually achieve. What is it around eight to 12 months? I probably have that wrong. Um, but uh, and then he goes on to say, a strange multiplicity of sensations sees me. I saw, felt, heard, and smelled at the same time. Synesthesia, right? And it was indeed a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. Um, so again, it's very much a novel about uh, consciousness and subjectivity. So as the brilliant and lovely Susan Blackmore explains, you all know her in this wonderful book, um, just describing synesthesia. Some people hear shapes, see noises, or feel sounds. And this odd form of unified consciousness is actually surprisingly common. Why don't I have it then? Um, so uh, notably, Blackmore, note, Blackmore notes, as I said before, many young children have synesthesia. Um, so it is interesting that, that Mary Shelley has presented her creature in this sort of expedited evolution in this way. Um, I think it is actually. <laughs> um, so more quotations. So by degrees, I remember a stronger light pressed upon my nerves so that I was obliged to shut my eyes. Darkness then came over me and troubled me. But hardly had I felt this when by opening my eyes, as I now suppose, the light poured in upon me. So again, it's like this this awakening of awareness um, and and just sort of being aware of the world around you, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so I walked and I believe descended, but I presently found a great alteration in my sensations. Uh, before dark and opaque bodies had surrounded me, um, but now I found that I could wander at liberty. So um, uh, evolving very quickly, <laughs> evolving very quickly for sure. Um, and he says, soon a gentle, uh, sorry, a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. So again, feeling the, the oh, is this the, uh, sorry, I'll keep going. I started up and beheld a radiant form rise from among the trees. I gazed with a kind of wonder, so that, that sense of awe that we get from nature. Um, it moved slowly, but it enlightened my past. So again, this increased knowledge from experience. Um, and then he goes on and looks for berries. So the creature is actually a, a, a vegetarian. Um, as was Percy Shelley, actually, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, so a little more and then I'll move on. So at this point, he's just overwhelmed by his senses, sensations. He says, no distinct ideas occupied my mind. All was confused. I felt light and hunger and thirst and darkness, all the stuff we feel every day. Innumerable sounds rung in my ears and on all sides, very sense saluted me. The only object that I could distinguish was a bright moon, and I fixed my eyes on that with pleasure. Um, well, it's nice. I guess there's more for you. Um, so I was delighted when I first discovered that a pleasant sound, which was often saluted, uh, which often saluted my ears, proceeded from the throats of little winged animals who had often intercepted the light from my eyes. So yeah, now he's he's and he tries to imitate the bird sounds too. Um, so I also observed with great accuracy the forms that surrounded me, and to perceive the boundaries of the radiant roof of light which canopied me. So light and darkness are so key to the novel, as is is movement and stasis so the the movement and motion and wind spirit the numinous music um that sort of thing is all, all important associated with life in the novel and then uh stasis obviously um associated with death so i will keep moving um because this is long already um so what's next okay you know this wonderful fellow so to study consciousness is to study a deep mystery about ourselves again that is Basically, what the study of what, or sorry, what Frankenstein is—a study of what it means to be a person um, and to live in in a world amongst other people. Um, and Virginia Woolf says something very similar. I shall invest, sorry, really investigate literature with a view to answering certain questions about ourselves. And this is so important here. She says characters are to be merely views, and personality should be avoided at all costs. So meaning that, in when we engage with another person, just as we engage with literature. There needs to be this suspension of the egoic self or suspension of ego or suppression of ego in order to fully 
empathize with the other, um, right? So you, so you enter this imaginative moral space where you can embody others, pe other people's experiences um, and thereby um, achieve true empathy um, and authentic communication. So this is what uh, Virginia Woolf sought to do specifically in her literature as well. She's wonderful. Um, so in his Descent of Man, Charles Darwin argues that humans will only flourish as a species if they learn to extend their sympathy to all sentient beings. Uh, similarly, in the Buddhist traditions, I'm sure you all know, compassionate identification with living things is essential to our existence and it requires a profound understanding of the relationship between living things coupled with an unswerving disposition of universal benevolence and compassion. Um, as neurobiologist Robert Provine writes, when we connect with one another, especially in groups, we are like a super organism with each individual being a sensory and motor, motor organ of the whole and sharing vicariously in the collective experience. So kind of like this conference, right? Um, all right, so Virginia Woolf still, so she says, our minds are all threaded together. Any live mind today is the very stuff of Plato's and Euripides. It is only a continuation and development of the same thing. It is this common mind that binds the whole world together and all the world is mind. And psychism, right? Um, I'm sure you've encountered this before. So as you all know, uh, panpsychism <laughs> pan is a theory or belief that consciousness is a prevailing and fundamental component of the universe. Uh, that it precedes matter. I hope they got that right. Uh, in other words, the phenomena of consciousness is inherent to the universe. So uh, thank you to Philip Hoff and, and de facto over all of you for uh, um, expanding my knowledge about this uh, wonderful theory and idea because it is deeply connected to um, the Romantic era and the idea of pantheism that was so so prevalent then. Um, so in William Wordsworth Tinter and Abbey, um, he suggests that divinity pervades nature and that nature therefore makes us moral. So this divinity connects is pervades nature but also humanity and that's how it connects humanity with nature. Um, so I have a quotation from it next. Um, I have felt a presence that disturbs me, whose dwelling is the light of the setting suns and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things and rolls through all things, the soul of all my moral being. So again, this, this idea of, of mind, consci or sorry, of consciousness too. Um, so consciousness being very similar to the divine, or you can just um, switch the words. Um, it's quite, sorry, I'm saying um a lot. Um, so here, <laughs> she goes it again. So pantheism, a belief or philosophical theory that God is imminent in or identical with the universe. Um, so again, the doctrine that God is everything, everything is God. So again, just replace God with consciousness and they seem pretty similar. Um, so for Wordsworth, nature is the soul of his being and just through nature that we become more sympathetic and that we learn to care about humanity. Um, so one another and recognize our interdependence. Um, so let's move on. Uh, this is just so it's long, but I just feel like it's so important to quote because it, it's all about the idea of, of waves and movement. Um, so Virginia Woolf, uh, so the quotation from um, a letter, she says, uh, style is a very simple matter. It is all rhythm. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. But on the other hand, here I am sitting after half the morning, crammed with ideas and visions and so on, and can't dislodge them for lack of the right rhythm. That was me. Uh, now this is very profound, what rhythm is, and goes far deeper than words. A sight, an emotion, creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. And in writing, such as my present belief, one has to recapture this and set this working, which has nothing apparently to do with words. And then as it breaks and tumbles in the mind, <laughs> it makes words to fit it. But no doubt I shall think differently next year. So Virginia Woolf is also very um, conscious of the um, the fluidity of self and how our selves change over time. We're not the same solid fixed self or constantly evolving and changing, which is a really good thing, um, I guess. Um, so again, talking about waves, uh, Ursula Le Guin, I love her in Telling is Listening, um, says that all living beings are oscillators. We vibrate, amoeba are human, we pulse, move rhythmically, we keep time. You can see it in the amoeba under the microscope vibrating in frequencies on the atomic, the molecular, the subcellular, and the cellular levels. That constant, delicate, complex throbbing is the process of life itself made visible. I love that so much. Um, and uh, we will keep going though. Um, I probably, oh yeah, thoughts. I was talking about thoughts. So um, you all know the definition of thought. So the action or process of thinking. Um, 
So one of the arguments I'm trying to work with is, is the idea of thought um, versus um, divine inspiration. So the spontaneous idea that, that comes to you when you're not actively forcing, forcing it to come, not actively thinking. Um, so I'm going to, I think, move into, oh yeah, so this really explains it well. So ideas like living creatures may arise and flourish going in all directions or abort and become extinct in completely unpredictable ways. So uh, the creature then is an idea, right? Um, Mary Shelley, uh, as you'll see in the author's introduction, refers to it as her hideous progeny. So both referring to Frankenstein, the novel, but it can also be read as as the creature, but it can also be read as this idea that she's had, that she's put forth into the world. So just as Frankenstein can no longer control the creature uh, once he's created him and, and he's out in the world, uh, nor can Mary Shelley control um, her novel and the creature itself and this idea she's had and it's um so again it's being reread and reinterpreted um infinitely by us which is pretty neat too so this is her author's introduction to 1831 edition of frankenstein and i won't read all of it obviously but it gives you a really really good sense of of her purpose in writing frankenstein and everything else so um, the publishers of the standard novels in selecting Frankenstein for one of their series expressed a wish that I should furnish them with some account of the origin of the story. Um, so she says, how I, then a young girl, came to think of and dilate upon so very hideous a an idea. Um, so Mary Shelley was the daughter of two brilliant uh, literary celebrities, Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. Uh, Wollstonecraft um, considered the mother of feminism. She wrote Vindications of the Rights of Women in 1792, this very powerful feminist treaties. Um, but notably, she her career was bookended by fiction. Um, and she one of her main arguments is that um, we can bring about change through fiction, through reading. Um, and so it would suggest to me, I think, um, and other critics have said this, um, that uh, the fact that her career both began and ended with fiction, that she felt that was the most powerful way to bring about the social change she sought. Um, so Mary Shelley says, it is not singular that as the daughter of two persons of distinguished literary celebrity, I should very early in life have thought of writing. As a child, I scribbled and my favorite pastime during the hours given to me for recreation was to write stories. Okay, she goes on to say, still, I had a dearer pleasure than this, uh, which was the formation of castles in the air, the indulging in waking dreams, the following up of trains of thought, which had their subject, the formation of a succession of imaginary incidents. So again, this um, author's introduction, um, which is written again um, after the first publication in 1818, um, she's really focusing on for sure, the creation of, of Frankenstein, the novel, but um, thought itself and ideas and imagination and, and where that comes from. Um, so Mary Shelley, even though um, not engaging in the neuroscience of consciousness, um, as you'll see, was very much uh, considering uh, same ideas um, related to the neuroscience of consciousness, the neuroscience of imagination, um, of empathy. <laughs> so uh, she was a brilliant lady. I will move on to the next. Okay, she goes on to talk about about um, the dream worlds and your imaginative worlds. Um, so my dreams were at once more fantastic and agreeable than my writings. In the latter, I was a close imitator, rather doing as others had done than putting down the suggestions of my own mind. Again, conveying her own personal inner subjective experience rather than trying to imitate others. Um, so again, cool lady. Uh, Mary Shelley goes on, that my dreams were all my own. I accounted for them to nobody. They were my refuge when annoyed, my dearest pleasure when free. Um, here we go. So this is um, sort of the back, not sort of, this is the background of um, how Frankenstein came to be. So um, in 1816, Mary Shelley goes with um, Percy Shelley, her lover, um, and Claire Claremont, who was her stepsister. Um, and they go to Switzerland, uh, Geneva specifically, to stay at the Villa Diodati. Um, and they become neighbors of Lord Byron, who was described by Caroline Lamb, one of his lovers, as mad, bad and dangerous to know. My kind of guy. Not really. Um, I will go to the next slide now. This one. So here is Lord Byron. He apparently uh, had lots of pets and brought a pet bear to the Villa Diodati too. Um, so he says we will each write a ghost story. Um, and they all agree. 
thought again. So she says, I thought and pondered vainly. I felt that blank incapability of invention, which is the greatest misery of authorship when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocation. Have you thought of a story? I was asked each morning and each morning I was forced to reply with a mortifying negative. So she's trying really hard. She's thinking so hard. Um, she's trying to push it um, and, and come up with this idea. Um, so after Mary Shelley tries in vain to think of a story, um, she retires to bed. Um, and it's then when she places her head on the pillow um, that it comes to her. And though she's not fully asleep, um, she's not thinking. She's in this um, sort of state of just existing. Um, and so she says, my imagine unbidden possessed and guided me, gifting the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of that reverie. So again, this sort of creative inspiration that comes once you sort of are able to let go of that um, sort of um, constraint of the self. Um, you need to sort of be free of the self and your own um, beliefs in order to um, really be divinely inspired. Uh, very common argument in the Romantic era. So here it comes. Um, I opened mine in terror. The idea so possessed my mind that a thrill of fear ran through me. So this idea of um, being possessed by thoughts and ideas and, and not having control of them, something that possesses you. Um, and then this like visceral response to it. And I wish to exchange the ghastly image of my fancy for the realities all around. But I could not so easily get rid of my hideous phantom. Still, it haunted me. So swift as light and as cheering was the idea that broke in upon me. I have found it. So it's this swift, uh, sudden um, appearance, uh, spontaneous. So she hasn't been thinking and ruminating. It's it's when she's in this waking dream that she's able to access this this other dimension, kind of moral dimension where the self is dissolved um, and can inhabit other beings. Um, so she says, what terrified me will terrify others, the idea of identification. Um, and I need only describe the specter which had haunted my midnight pillow. Uh, so the next day she announced that she has thought of a story. Um, I began that day with the words. It was on a dreary night in November. That is indeed how it starts. Uh, making only a transcript of the grim terrors of my waking dream. So in the end, she says, and now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. So again, uh, that language of, of giving birth. Um, and again, that hideous progeny can be um, the novel itself. Um, it can be the creature within the novel. Um, and the creature itself can represent the idea that then um, sort of flourishes and that is no longer um, something that Mary Shelley can control. Okay, to conclude then, uh, the universe is founded upon connection and interdependence, a notion represented very powerfully, pervasively, and prophetically in Shelley's writings. Um, as Lord Raymond, um, a figure in Mary Shelley's The Last Man, uh, which is very, uh, very relevant to right now, it's about a plague that destroys all of mankind but one man. Um, so he declares that philosophers have called man a microcosm of nature and find a reflection in the internal mind for all this machinery visibly at work around us. So, so wonderfully said. So that is the internal workings of the mind reflect or mirror the world around us, the fractals in the human body and echo of those in nature, the human brain cell reflecting the universe itself. Um, so we are all responsible for one another and for the world in which we live. Um, as Martin Rees warns, uh, this century is the first in which one species, ours, can determine the biosphere's fate. And he insists that we need to think globally, we need to think rationally, and we need to think long term, empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science alone can't provide. Um, so these are the values Shelley offers in her fiction, teaching her that the immensity of nature mirrors the mind of man. And if we understand our affinity, affinity with one another and with nature itself, that in Shelley's words, our lives mingle with the universe of existence, we will then approach Emmanuel Levinas's ethical event, being for the other rather than for the self. Uh, thank you so much. It was just an absolute pleasure uh, to get to get to talk. Um, I'm just very honored to, to be part of this incredible conference. Um, I hope this is enjoyable and I wish everyone a beautiful day. Thank you very much. My name is Stuart Moody. I live in Tucson and co-founded the Mindful Ambassadors Program of Campus Health. My studies in consciousness began in college, where the first course I completed was a four-day class in Transcendental Meditation, or TM. Expansion of awareness was one of the benefits promised. 
I did not know what that would mean, but our teacher touched on it lightly on the last night. Shortly after meditation, we heard some people outside walking by our open classroom window. Suddenly they burst into delighted laughter. See, our instructor said, meditators create a warmer air around them. I took his comment as tongue in cheek, but was intrigued. Could our state of being have an influence on the world around us? In 1976, the first TM research on such social influence was reported. 22 cities were compared. 11 experimentals, where 1% of the population had learned TM. 11 controls with less than 1%. The two groups were matched along a number of demographic variables. The 1% cities showed a significant decline in crime rate, while the other 11 saw crime increase by roughly the same amount. Today's presentation is grounded in experiences and reports such as these. Many spiritual traditions hold that the quality of human consciousness affects natural phenomena. Several lines of modern inquiry offer suggested evidence of a mind-nature connection. The status of this notion may be analogous to our earlier understanding of the mind-body connection. In the 60s, we were unsure of claims that illness could be prevented or healed through consciousness-based practices. Some 50 years later, the integrated relationship of mind and body is the subject of multiple applications in health promotion, treatment, and education, and continuing research. Is it possible then that internal states can be invisibly communicated and affect the body of Earth as they affect our own bodies? If so, could technologies of consciousness be used to restore aquifers or improve stream flows? I will outline a few types of evidence, offer critiques, and end with three suggestions for immediate application. Environmental psychologist James Swan recounts an outdoor gathering at Mesa Verde National Park in 1990. A cold drizzle fell on the crowd at a symposium on spirit and place. One of the speakers, Cheyenne spiritual leader Bill Talbo, procured a cigarette and took it into the bushes where he began to chant and toss bits of tobacco in the four cardinal directions, down to the earth, up to the sky. The cloud that had been looming over the amphitheater moved away. Sun shone in the immediate vicinity, just in time for the first speaker. While she spoke, Tall Bull continued, lips moving slowly, quietly. Then it was his turn to speak. As he took the podium, clouds started moving back toward the amphitheater. A half hour later, with his closing words, a gust of wind swept through, dropping a sheet of rain, washing out the rest of the program. From the perspective of modern science, this story is an anecdote, a single event without control, without replication. From the perspective of indigenous science, the story represents the age-old use of ritual and ceremony to make a request of nature. A literature on indigenous science or traditional ecological knowledge contains many references to this kind of requesting and negotiating. Rain dances are familiar examples. In 2012, a Hopi artist told me about two. The land had become very dry. On July 21, the nation held a one day ceremony. This included a rain dance performed by Kachina dancers who had spent days in spiritual preparation. Afterward, rain fell. A week later, they held a second dance. We got a really good downpour that time, she said. A Christian rain ceremony took place in the urban Southeast in 2007 during a long standing drought. On the steps of the State House in Atlanta, Governor Jerry Perdue led hundreds in prayers for rain. Rain fell the next day and the following morning. Observers did know that the weather had been pretty cloudy that day, and there was a chance of rain in the forecast. These examples, of course, do not prove a cause-effect relationship between spiritual practice and hydrologic event. Searching for papers on rain dance by a scholar turned up citations either referring to the rain dance 
as an example of superstition or mentioning it in the context of indigenous tradition without reference to scientific texts. Returning to modern science, the authors of the TM study on reduced crime rate concluded with the assertions shown on this slide. Collective consciousness is a phenomenon. The individual is the basic unit. Refining individual consciousness has a purifying effect on the collective. Though that study did not make it to a journalist on numerous projects, resulting in over 30 journal articles to date. One study shown here looked at the impact of group practice of TM in combination with the advanced TM city program. While 1% of the population meditating was originally seen as the critical threshold for the postulated field effect of consciousness, this study posited a much smaller threshold when the strengthening factors of group practice and the TM city technique were present. That threshold square root of 1% of the population. Using time series analysis, workers found that whenever the predicted threshold of meditators was reached at assemblies in Jerusalem, war deaths in neighboring Lebanon dropped 76%. A replication study employing a highly experienced independent scorer who knew nothing about the hypothesis looked at the same period as the first, plus the subsequent two and a quarter years. The effect size was even greater. War deaths dropped 85% each time the threshold of meditators was reached. The savings in human suffering are incalculable. Studies were also being done on prayer. Physician Randolph Bird attempted a large scale controlled test of prayer on behalf of 393 patients in a hospital's coronary care unit. His findings were considered groundbreaking statistically significant positive effects of Christian prayer on six of 26 outcomes and on a three-point global hospital outcome scale. Reviewing the literature on prayer and medicine, including Bird's study, Gio Comini reported that of the 18 apparently authentic trials she could identify, few found associations between remote prayer and outcomes. One of these authentic trials was performed by Herbert Benson and colleagues. Their study was on a much larger scale than birds. To everyone's credit, the American Heart Journal published the results, which were nil. The design of Benson's prayer intervention seems reductionist. Volunteer prayer groups from churches were given first name, last initial, and an anonymous site code for each person who was to receive intercessory prayer. Time allotted to prayer was minimal. Sitcher, on the other hand, employed a more dynamic protocol for patients with AIDS. 40 experienced distant healers were recruited from professional healing organizations. They received color photos and first names of their subjects, were instructed to work on the assigned subject for approximately one hour per day for six consecutive days. End size was much smaller a significant and positive effects were observed for the treated patients as noted on this slide. Giacomini, however, is not satisfied. Most trials are negative, she states flatly. One disconcerting finding in her review was the misinterpretation of a supposedly retroactive treatment reported by Libovici. In his report, prayers purportedly took place four to 10 years after the health outcomes for the prayer targets. The paper appeared in a lighthearted Christmas issue of the British Medical Journal as a cautionary demonstration that a large enough randomized controlled trial could support a theoretically implausible intervention. Its findings were included nonetheless in a 2007 Cochrane Review of Prayer. Without notice of its unusual premise, or other cues of mischief, such as a medieval illumination with the caption, angels make the universe turn and time moves on. The uneven results in prayer studies stand in sharp contrast to the large effect sizes associated with TM. 
Other meditation techniques have also shown favorable outcomes on a variety of medical and well-being indices. A few examples are shown on this slide. What each of these methods offers is a set of systematic procedures, usually with recommended frequency and duration of practice. Prayer studies, on the other hand, have used a wide gamut of protocols, often with little direction on the nature or duration of prayer to be performed. Praying for rain does not appear to be a likely tool in the resource management kit quite yet. It also runs the risk of being treated as another expedient, a spiritual resource to be exploited in the same way that other natural resources are. As critics pointed out after the prayers for rain in Atlanta, it wasn't God who allowed an outdoor theme park to build a million gallon mountain of artificial snow while the Southeast was running dry. It was Governor Purdue and his fellow elected officials. They also allowed the wasteful irrigation of Georgia's cotton farms and the rampant overbuilding and overslurping of metropolitan Atlanta. The structure built into meditative practices, along with their cultivation and well being and goodwill, tends to, to mitigate the utilitarian mindset that has led to exploitation of the earth and the environmental crises that we now face. Rather, these practices incline a person towards more responsible relations with life. We don't meditate in order to get a better parking place. Rather, we plan ahead so that parking does not create stress. Better yet, we take public transit or ride a bike. Extending the mind-nature relationship further, in the 1980s, Scientists at Princeton looked at the capability of human beings to affect machines. Radin and Utz, for example, had subjects attempt through mental intent to alter the pattern of binary outputs, zeros or ones, in random event generators. Volunteers were given audio or visual feedback to indicate success as they attempted to alter the pattern of signal emitted. They wished for either zeros or ones. And the photo shows one such volunteer. Over several studies with different volunteers whom they dubbed operators, 12 control tests were non-significant. That is, when people spent time next to the devices with no intent of influencing their signals, there were indeed no observable patterns in the random sequences produced by the REGs. In eight of 27 experiments, with subjects consciously trying to think the machine into a particular pattern, pattern alteration shows significance. By the mid-1990s, experimenters were asking whether significant events affecting a community at large would register on the devices, now called random number generators, or RNGs. Nelson and colleagues carried RNGs to a variety of gatherings to see whether they would respond to a shared community experience characterized by high emotional resonance. Effects in most settings were known, including in home football games at Princeton. Most games, the authors remarked, were lackluster that season. But when Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated in 1995, RNGs registered a powerful, low probability mean shift and an extraordinary effect size. By 2002, workers developed a globally distributed array of 37 RNGs with at least one on each inhabited content, continent. Arbitrary samples from a continuous four-year data set met criteria for true randomness. Of particular interest then were deviations noted on September 11, 2001, at the time of the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks. Contextual analyses, the authors noted, indicate that these cannot be attributed to identifiable physical interactions and may be attributable to some unidentified interaction associated with human consciousness. Researchers began investigating remote communication between humans, individuals. For example, Radit and others looked at brainwave response shared between pairs of individuals with emotional connections. Pairs were shielded from visual, electromagnetic, or audio contact with each other during the testing periods and asked to keep a sense of connection with each other during the task. 
One of the pair was designated sender, the other receiver. In his review of the literature, Radin noted that roughly 15% of people show non-chance positive EEG correlations between isolated pairs of people. His study showed a greater effect. Three of 13 pairs, or 23%, had correlations in their event-related response potentials. <clears throat> So what is going on here? Depending on which stream of research we consider, the answer ranges from not much to quite a bit. In one study on a compassionate intention from sender to receiver by Radin and colleagues, the peak changes in the receiver's skin conductance response, quote, amounted to fractions of a microsemen, end of quote. But the authors note, small magnitude effects do not mean no effects. In the case of the Jerusalem Peace Assemblies during the war in Lebanon, the effect size was dramatic as well as statistically significant, 76 to 85 percent reduction in war deaths, coincident with each day that the threshold number of meditators was reached. Prayer studies do not consistently demonstrate healing effects. In her critique of complementary medicine's fascination with healing prayer, Giacomini argues that evidence alone is not sufficient to prove a treatment. Evidence, she says, is now prized even when it's incapable of providing meaningful information, in particular when underlying causal theory is inscrutable, end of quote. Workers in distant healing intention acknowledge this inscrutability. Nelson and colleagues, for example, comment that while the effects in these experiments are statistically robust, they resist explanation by a canonical scientific model. Leibovici, who wrote that um, tongue-in-cheek story about retroactive prayer, Leibovici cautions that dedicating funds to research on inexplicable constructs such as remote healing is analogous to the reed warbler's feeding of a voracious cuckoo chick whose egg has been placed in the warbler's nest. Instead, he says, we should base our decision on whether to practice, uh, to adopt a practice, that decision should be based on three legs. Empirical evidence, a deep model of the physical world, and our commitment to the well-being of patients. Students of distant healing, meditation, and indigenous practices are clearly dedicated to the first and third criteria. Do they have a deep model? Rupert Sheldrake outlines eight candidates for a model. One of these, quantum mechanics, is referred to by both distant intentionality and TM researchers. Radin, for example, comments that the relationship observed in his study of paracorrelated EEG readings is reminiscent of quantum entanglement. Acknowledging that quantum entanglement occurs in vanishingly small increments of time and space, he notes that it's now possible to sustain entanglement of macroscopic objects, that is, gas clouds with trillions of atoms, at room temperature for milliseconds, an extremely long lifetime in this context. Dobek and colleagues discussing findings of reduced crime rate in 48 of the 1% TM cities cite social theories which see crime as an expression of the whole complex social field. They posit further that the social field exists as a more basic reality which displays properties of physical fields described by quantum field theory. During TM practice, they say the individual can directly experience this field, a state of pure consciousness without mental activity. <clears throat> Systems theory is then offered to explain the effects of individuals' experience of pure consciousness on the collective consciousness of the community. Imagine a system of N elements displaying wave phenomena for example, brain waves, circulatory cycles, breathing rhythms. If a subpopulation exceeding the square root of n exhibits coherent functioning, then the whole system will become more coherent. This principle, Dilbeck explains, is the basis of laser light and other coherent physical phenomena. In this model, 
Crime expresses lack of coherence or orderliness within the social system, reflecting tension and incoherence within individuals. By this logic, a large-scale transition to coherence of the social system could be catalyzed by a small percentage of individuals within the system, generating a very coherent influence in their consciousness. The indigenous model emphasizes relatedness between all parts of creation, connections so interwoven that each part belongs to and is part of and affects every other. <clears throat> what then can resource managers do with these diverse, uneven, and sometimes incredible findings when it comes to system planning and adaptive management? Three courses of action come to mind. One, get quiet. Based on research, on mindful movement, conscious breathing, and deep relaxation, managers could consider exploring one or more practices for their own benefit. Improved sleeping patterns, reduced usage of health insurance benefits, greater attention and stability, improved social relations, are a few of the results seen with regular practice of such techniques. Based on the TM research, meeting with others for group meditation, even over Zoom, sounds like a good idea too. Number two, pay attention. Problems of environmental degradation have come from a lack of attention to signals from the natural world and to the consequences of our actions. One obvious antidote is to cultivate our attentional capabilities, both sensory and emotional, to better see and hear and feel what is happening in the world around us. Mindful practices such as those mentioned above cultivate a deeper sensory and effective connection with the world. This somatic connectedness counterbalances the tendency of within our heads, encouraged by the industrial growth model. Three, stay curious. One area in which to cultivate curiosity could be this very topic, hidden technologies, that is, methods for connecting with the world from within. Keeping your eyes out for reports or studies of mind nature connectedness could open doors to exciting discoveries and applications. On that last note, I hope that each of you listening today will consider conducting or participating in research on the field of consciousness, the field effect of consciousness, whether through distant intentionality, meditation, prayer, or indigenous ceremony. We have still much to learn. <laughs>